And our next speaker is Professor Eric Hallgren. Eric uh, received his PhD from UCLA in 1976 and uh, stayed there finally as an associate professor until 1997. And I think it was mid mid 1990s that you visited Helsinki and did some some interesting experiments with Reed and also with Tommy Rai, who is in the audience. Um, audience. And then 1997, Eric uh, moved to the um, uh, University of Utah, where a new MEC center, even with two MECs next to each other, was set up. And, and I have actually many fond memories from those times because, because we visited Utah many, many times for a couple of weeks because the prototype, prototype of the vector view was in, installed there before it actually functioned very well so that we did the final phases of product development basically at the Uni University of Utah. And I remember Eric was using the very early version of, early version of free surfer and uh, some kind of precursor of m and &E software, and he was singing there, not uh, in the rain, but something like, I am inflating <laughs> the brain, I am happy again. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then in 2000, he moved here, here to Boston to, to set up uh, our <laughs> wonderful MEC laboratory at MCH, and then finally in the, in the middle of the first decade of this millennium, he he moved to back to back to home. I would say to California to UCSD to become become a professor of radiology there. And I think um, it's fair to say that Eric is very keen in understanding how the invasive measures from the brain and the surface measures that we collect with the EEG and MEC are related, and how the different stories that they are telling us about the brain relate. And I think his uh, talk will touch some of these issues and his title is Stages of uh, Understanding. Please. Thank you very much, Mati. Uh, that was a, a lovely introduction and, and uh, I, I, you, you know the dates better uh, of my life than I do uh, and uh, I would have expected you to. So uh, I, I'm honored to be amongst this group. I'm honored to be here to uh, celebrate David's 40th anniversary, the sole author of the sole publication that invented this wonderful technology. And uh, I was, you know, I started working with, with intracranial recordings. And when I started working, it was, of course, anything field potentials were, were you know. Uh, so we did units. and. Um, then any idea that you could do something outside the head was was you know was was ridiculous, and uh, eventually through through uh, MEG I was converted to um, the possibility for for um, discovering something important. And that's very nice to to be here amongst you. And and I ha want to thank the previous speakers for having such wonderful talks and keeping everybody in the room. So I'm going to try to move uh, quickly. I'm sure everybody is, uh, has uh, saturated LTP. I'm going to talk about stages of word understanding. Uh, and the, the first part of the talk is going to be uh, phenomenological, you know, descriptive. What are those stages? Uh, what do they do? Where are they located? When do they occur? What is the neural basis? How do they interact? Uh, who do you see them in? And it is wonderful to be phenomenological. I, I like that. But, um, but we, we, the big payoff, of course, is to try to understand something about uh, these fundamental issues in word understanding, these fundamental issues that, that psychologists have been, under, have been working on a long time, but they've been trying to do it with a black box. And uh, we, we can look inside that box a little bit. We can shake it. Uh, so, so one question I'm going to broach is, is acoustophonetic processing, and it took a long time to figure out that was the right word, but there are people here who will disagree, I'm sure, uh, affected by the lexicosemantic context. That just means, is it, <laughs> yeah, in the front row, too, uh, <laughs> in my reviewer. Um, so uh, is it, 
is, is, is the expectation we have for what a word means, does that affect how we hear words? For, for what, what word you're going to get based on the context, is that affecting how you hear things? Secondly, do written words have to be recoded phonologically before lexical access? So, you know, in other words, if you're reading something, do you have to kind of sound it out inside your brain? Maybe you don't, don't actually hear it, but you have to sound it out inside your Wernicke's area or something to access what word it is and what it means. And then the third uh, question is, does lexical access precede semantic encoding? And, you know, a neuroscientist would say, yeah, well, duh, you know, you have to know what the word is before you figure out what it means. But, you know, maybe that's not so. So the brain's actually, we have to respect it. And uh, I was invited by the, uh, the organizers to talk about, you know, MEG and uh, intracranial, and I'm going to mix them up um, ad libitum. So it actually starts with, the story starts with EEG. This is from um, uh, Marta Kudis and Steve Hilliard's publication in Science, uh, low these many years ago, and they showed normal subjects um, uh, this, uh, these sentences visually, and then the last word uh, would be normal here in the dark line. Uh, it was his first day at work, uh, or sometimes it was, he spread the warm bread with socks. And when they spread the warm bread with socks, they got this stashed line up here, this N400, 400 milliseconds after the word onset, there was this peak. It was recorded it's like right here. It's where, where you record it relative to the ears. And uh, they, they had this control. She put on her high-heeled shoes, and shoes was big font, and that evoked this P3. So we just forget about that. So you can actually get this N400 in lots of different situations. Uh, you know, if like you, you prime it with a sentence fine, but you can also prime it just with a preceding word, cat, then dog. So if you compare the response to dog and jet, well, it's much bigger to jet because you've decreased it to dog. So the priming decreases the N400, at least that's how I see it. And this, this prime can be, you know, it can be in the auditory modality, even though this is visual or vice versa. It can be a picture. It can be, you know, some inference. So, so this is like really a very semantic sort of influence on, on this. And that kind of, you know, this idea that you evoke an isolated word will evoke a great big N4, a normal, big, big sized N4. So, so that gives you the idea that what must be happening is that something's deciding, some antecedent process is deciding this is possibly a word, and then it's emitted the N400, and then you have some sort of modulation that will decrease it if it's easier to figure out what the word is, if it's easier to do this lexicosemantic encoding. And again, you know, that was a long, long fight, and I'm sure I'll get some, some feedback on that. But um, so this, this is kind of brought out in, into contrast with the observation that, you know, you can compare blardo, which is, yes, it's not a word, uh, but it might be a word. And so the difference between blardo and this consonant strings is like, you know, between a congruent and incongruent real word. So in other words, to a pronounceable non-word, you get to just define N4. Does that mean the N400 doesn't have anything to do with, with language? I don't think so, because what it's saying is that we don't know yet that it's not a word. It's the process of the brain figuring out if it's a word, you know, accessing the meaning, trying to figure out what meaning it is, that, that is uh, the N400. So it is, has the implication also that we basically, our brains use the same process for learning words as for understanding words. You know, it suggests that, and I, I think this is uh, the case. So uh, I have David's uh, picture here. Uh, of the areas that are activated, greater activation in bold to sublexical stimuli than nonspecific controls. Uh, and so this is, we could say that acoustophonetic encoding, and I have the microphone, I'm sorry. Uh, and then there is uh, another figure here from Binder uh, that is the areas that with um, bold was showing differences related to semantics. And so this is suggesting that maybe the initial 
um, the initial processing is focal and the semantic processing is slightly distributed. Uh, and I'm, I'm so thankful to you for, for doing this summary uh, slides because I could never read these hundreds, thousands of, of fMRI studies. And it's, it's very gratifying to know that the F word has not been used much today. Um, so so in, in, the, in the visual modality, this relates to uh, the, the visual word form area. Uh, and this is, again, uh, bold studies that uh, radiological convention, it's on the wrong side, um, but uh, where various contrasts between um, words and consonants here, uh, and in this case between words and uh, sensory controls, uh, produce activation in this uh, posterior fusiform gyrus. And uh, lesions in this area, this is a, one of the typical small lesions, can produce uh, an alexia. Uh, difficulty reading. So you, you also see with Meg, this is a, a study we did with uh, Spanish, uh, English bilinguals, and, and you, you get, again, this, this sort of uh, left hemisphere um, activation back in, in this region when people are reading words. And that's at about, um, oh, this was really early, I understand why, but, but around 150 milliseconds. So, um, so, so we, we did a study where we compared uh, real words to um, consonant strings so, uh, and, and to false fonts, right, which we just made by cutting up the, the consonant strings and then paste, cutting up the letters and then, then pasting them back together. And we reasoned that if there was a uh, letter form area, that that would be... Um, shown by some difference between the consonants and false fonts without a difference to the real words, and that the difference between the real words and consonants, which is seen for the word form area, that, that would show that. That contrast would show the word form area. And so in the orange here was the fMRI, and that's showing the, the, um, this contrast between uh, real words and consonants, and this is showing in red the, the contrast with fMRI between consonants and false fonts, so letter form, word form you know, in this ventral stream, and it's consistent with other work like by um, Vinquier uh, and, and others that, that there are a series of, of um, specialized areas down here that are coding for um, more and more complicated aspects of words, you know. So uh, it, with Meg, if you do an estimated strength in these different areas, uh, you can see that at about uh, 160 milliseconds, the activity estimated here is distinguishing between up here are words and consonants, and down here are false fonts. And that later, here's 225 milliseconds, you get all three being distinguished. So that's nice, but um, the inverse problem is ill-posed. So every time somebody shows you an inverse solution, you have to remember that they aren't sure, and uh, different inverse solutions give different results. So um, I always like to use some intracranial recordings to try and figure this out. And so we, we recorded, uh, this is just one subject, and I hope it's in the corner, you can see it. Uh, and in this subject, we did fMRI before they were implanted, and we got electrodes right over the area that was activated by this contrast between consonants and false fonts. And uh, lateral and medial, we got no activity. And right above this, we got a lot of activity to these, these stimuli. And here is the local field potential, average local field potential. And here are the high gamma power. And I, I don't know if you can see it because it's not projecting all that well, but you see this peak here? That's the false fonts, and this peak is a consonance. Uh-oh, it's bigger than the false fonts. Well, you can't tell with LFPs if it's excitatory or inhibitory, right? So we say it's bigger, but you can't say just because it's bigger that you have more activation, you have more activity. And in fact, if you look at the consonants, here, they're much bigger than the false fonts, you know, recorded simultaneously by the same electrodes, just treated differently. This high gamma power, we just take the high gamma and we, you know, average it from 70 to 190 hertz or something. 
Uh, so this is just the noise of the crowd. This is the chanters, okay? It's like you're in a football stadium. There's a little, there's a little group of people who are chanting, right? They are spatially organized, and they are, spati and they are temporally synchronous. And that is what the, the LFPs are seeing. That's what Meg is seeing, because Meg is just, you know, the LFPs recorded outside the head. And LFPs are actually generated by currents, and this current source density identifies where they are. All of these have the same influence. They are, they are a subsample of the activity. And, and some people say, those, you want to hear the people who are chanting, you know, maybe it's the orchestra you know, rather than the audience. Uh, we don't know, but it's, it's a subsample. It's some special, some special people, some special neurons, some special synapses as opposed to these other measurements. And fMRI PET, uh, as, as was pointed out, very highly correlated with high gamma power, which is just a reflection of single unit activity and fast synaptic activity. So you lose, going from here, you lose information encoding. You don't have you know, the differences between all these different neurons in the little area that are each saying something different. Uh, when you go from here to here, you lose temporal resolution. High gamma power has great temporal resolution, you know, millisecond temporal resolution, just like Meg. So here you know, you know from this, that this activation here with fMRI has this time course. So this is saying, yeah, there is also LFP generated there at the same time. Uh, so when I got back from... from uh, Rita's lab, and thank you very much for your hospitality. It was exceptional. Uh, we, um, we started the study with, with the same task that was described here uh, with the words, and this was in Utah, and we uh, were looking for the N400, and here's like 10 subjects, and here are the fields that were recorded, and these fields have, you know, just a nice dipolar pattern, I guess, and loci locates right here. And this was previously done in Rita's lab uh, by Rita Salmanen. And, uh, and, and this sort of, you know, Wernicke's area single dipole had, had been reported. And we, you know, were interested in using Anders' technique, uh, which was uh, this um, uh, anatomically constrained uh, minimum norm estimate uh, developed originally, you know, based on, on Mati's discovery of that. And uh, we see here this subject, when we do this MNE type, or it's called DSPM in our lab, uh, we get something that, yes, involves this Broca's, this Wernicke's area, but also some Broca's area and some uh, anteroventral temporal cortex. So what is right? Again, the what is right is indeterminate from the MEG. You have to go inside the head. And we've recorded from thousands of places, and we've been doing it for a long time. And uh, this was a summary we made of where the generators were of the N400 prior to ever recording MEG. And so we, we, we thought that the fact that we're getting, you know, uh, with, with DSPM, something up here and something down here, as well as something up here, made us like that method. And that's what we're going to use here instead of the dipole method. You know, I, I don't know. I think it's right because it is so bad. You know, it is so, so uh, smeared. It maybe is a good method. Um, so just... This, this then leads to some sort of model where in, in comes visual information, then there are these series of, of uh, steps, and then you know, one of these steps is, is a key spot here, is kind of a bottleneck of the P170 that's encoding the word, the word form, and then around here at N, uh, N400, which is, seems to be maximal here in the, in the base of the temporal lobe. So, um, uh, we, we looked then with, with this method uh, at the uh, phase locking values um, that um, Lachaud introduced, which is just you know, how consistent the phase is uh, in, in a given frequency between trials. And so this is a, a phase locking 
with, with the trial onset of these, these different phases. Um, uh, well, actually, between the phase locking is between different locations, but at different times after trial onset. All right? So this is uh, a plot of the absolute phase locking values. And I don't know, people in the audience who've used them might be shocked at these. These are like 0.7 uh, level uh, of phase locking that is evoked in this situation here. So that's, you know, usually it's much, much lower. So this is like almost, they're, they're almost saying exactly the same thing in, in these frequency ranges. And so this is between this um, location, which is there in the letter area, and uh, all of these other areas, which, which can be quite distant here in, in the, the prefrontal cortex, for example. That is, um, though, at um, a, a lower, lower threshold, which I can't see here. I think it was cut off. But it's, it's more like you know, 0.3 or 0.4, which is still very high. OK, so, so there is this first sweep. And then there is a, a broad, wide band up to about 30 hertz um, phase locking between the areas. So initial sweep and then phase lock. And uh, that is to words. And of course, it's much smaller to these other, uh, to the consonants or the false fonts. And it actually, in the same recording, when we got very medial here over lingual gyrus, this is a blow up of the bottom of the brain here. And here we are in this, this area that's responding to words as opposed to false fonts. So this is the, re the high gamma response to the word. Here's the high gamma response to false fonts. We have an area that's responding to the false fonts in the lingual gyrus. So, you know, actually, if you look all over the brain, there's a lot more response to false fonts than there is to words. And this is actually consistent with a lot of EEG and MEG data. And that kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, did the brain really evolve to operate on false fonts? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, but uh, that, that leads one to, to an interesting observation, which I'm going to show you here. And that is, when you present a word, there is a very strong phase locking between these two areas. When you present, and these are coming in random order, right? And when you present a false font, there is no phase locking between these two areas, even though this area is like super active. What's going on? Maybe the way things work is that there are nonspecific streams, and these nonspecific streams are automatically activated unless the template is matched. And if the template is matched, this, these other streams are inhibited. And this, this sort of thing, thought can also be applied to the N400. So this is communication in order to integrate, and this is communication in order to focus. Because the thing is, you have to realize, and this is the beauty of MEG, and this is something you never think about with fMRI, is it has to evolve in time. You don't know anything until you know it. This is you have to bootstrap your understanding over time. And this is an example where you don't know yet if it's a word or a false font. As you learn to know that, then you have to redirect on the fly what you're doing with it. And that's maybe what we're seeing here. Okay. So um, next is what is their neural basis and how do they interact? And I'm going to um, go, go fairly quickly through this. We, we are fortunate to have um, in a very small number of cases uh, microelectrode array recordings. Uh, that we can relate to, to the, um, the language uh, uh, studies. And this is a neuroport, which has 96 contacts that go one millimeter into the brain. And we can uh, separate out uh, many single units and, and, and call them uh, parabola cells or interneurons. And we also have something called a laminar electrode, which has 24 contacts in 3 millimeters. And with that, we can deduce current source density. And from current source density and the multi-unit recordings, you can deduce where the sinks and sources are, which is the active synapses, what layers they're in during the task with respect to time. And that's important because the brain is a, a pizza. It's about, you know, about the size of a pizza and about the thickness of a pizza, and it's layered. And the organization, the way it's wired, depends on these layers. 
So if you can figure out what the inputs and outputs are as far as the layers go, you can figure out a lot about the connectivity. So uh, the way the connectivity works is that the first input is into layer four, like in this top-down way, you know, bottom-up way rather, you know, like going from V1 down to wherever. And that's mainly an AMPA, GABA-A operation. And then this activation goes up to upper layers and then down to lower layers, and they go back up, and the associative input is coming in up here. And that's more of an NMDA uh, GABA-B operation. So these are two separate systems. They're about equally strong. They have as much, uh, they have as many uh, um, fibers underlying them, and uh, they're just as organized. Uh, but they, they are probably doing very different things, and we saw there seems to be in language processing a first pass, which is a speed forward passing through, which is some sort of template matching, and then the second pass, which is broad, associative, uh, and hand-waving, uh, and that is this uh, going up here into the upper layers. And that indeed is what we see when we do the laminar recordings. Uh, this is the... Um, um, a, a, a task uh, that, that Anders did, uh, which was a size judgment task. People uh, saw single words, and they decided if the word uh, represented an object or an animal that was bigger than a foot in length, if it fit in a shoebox. And this is the, and there, the, half the words repeated. This is to the new words, and this is difference between the new and the old words. And this is 185 milliseconds at the time, maybe, of this uh, activation down here of the uh, ventral word form area. And this is the, the time of the um, N400. And you can see in the new minus old, there's nothing here, and there's a lot here, including the side of the electrode, which is about right there. So this, this little microelectrode, the first thing that happens is around 200 milliseconds and you get a uh, sink here in, in the middle layer. That's consistent with this feed forward uh, template matching sort of operation. And then up here, the time of the N400, you have uh, a, um, uh, a sink in the upper layers, which is consistent with being associative. And then you can see also there is some, some oscillations there, which we'll get back to. And uh, those oscillations are more apparent if you superimpose single sweeps. And so we superimpose the single sweeps here, and what happens is you have this, this activity that appears disorganized here, uh, but actually has a lot of theta rhythm in it, and it is uh, theta delta. And then the stimulus comes on, and it is, you have a, a sharp response, which is the feed forward, which is not present in the baseline activity. And then it resets the theta, which is, is then what you see here in these, these successive cycles. And um, that's what all this is about. And uh, so here is a single sweep. And this is the uh, position of the, um, the parandal cell. And this is the middle layer. Uh, and so these are spontaneous uh, thetas, which are showing this, this alternating sync between upper and, and middle layers. The stimulus comes on. It's reset. And then you have these, these alternating sinks again. And so, so the, the hypothesis is that uh, this initial sink is, is acquiring information, and then the upper sink is associating it. So um, recently, uh, Ksenia Marinkovich and colleagues in, in our group uh, this has implemented uh, one of the uh, methods here that, uh, of, of source space uh, theta localization. And she is, was comparing these pseudo words, these pronounceable non words, with real words and getting a very big response, uh, which you see uh, between the red and the, the green here, uh, in the language areas uh, to, to this difference. So, post N400, this uh, event related theta is differentiating meaning. So, this continued activation, and it makes sense. You know, you figure out in the first pass, in the N400, that's not a word. And after that, you know, you're done. But uh, you continue if it is a real word. 
And uh, I'm not going to go into that because I'm not going to have time, but, but we have some evidence, uh, again, Marinkovich, that uh, this later activity is, is related to reprocessing, which um, you do get to jokes. What do you call a cow with its feet in the air, ground beef? So the N400 is really killed by that, right? No, there's no N400. This is, uh, his feet are in the air, you know, he's a beef, you know, so no N400. But great big activity later because uh, you have to reprocess it. Um, all right. So, uh, who do they, how do they develop and who do they occur in? So, I'm now going to go back uh, and, and give a little more information. Uh, here, we, we, we don't study infants with intracranial recordings. Uh, a lot of them are done, but they're usually really, really sick. So this is something which we can do uh, is, is infants in, in the Meg. Uh, and we decided, my, my graduate student Katie Travis, who recently graduated, decided to look at whether, uh, what their N400 was like. And they're like, you know, 14 to 18 months old, and she used two tasks. One was uh, she presented sounds that were matched to words. So obviously all auditory stimuli. And uh, so cat, and then there was this, this noise. But it was a really good noise because it was noise vocoded. So, so we took different bands and we matched the envelope of the, the power in the different bands. So it, it should have been a very good uh, control and they were individually matched to each word. And uh, we made sure that our averages were consisted of the words and their individually matched controls. And lo and behold, the babies had a beautiful N400 that was peaking in the same sensors and at the same time as, uh, <laughs> as, as humans. And uh, <laughs> spoken as a father. And, uh, uh, and, and, and then what she did was she, she showed a picture of a cat, and she played either the word cat or she played you know, some other word. She, she, she showed a picture of a ball, and she played the word cat. So she compared those. And again, you're comparing exactly the same word. There's no, 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 no question that maybe you know, the... Um, some of the differences are due to sensory you know, level differences. And I, I feel your pain there, um, David, because you know, <laughs> this is what we obsess about too with auditory stimuli. And, um, and, and we found, and she found, that uh, again, there was uh, a response that looked very much like this uh, incongruity response to the incongruous words, the words that didn't match uh, the picture in the babies that, that was very much like you, you see in adults. And so this is the incongruous minus congruous uh, DSPM map in the, adult, in the infants, and this is in the adults. And the, you really can't tell the difference. And this is the response to the words and the response to the noise. And again, you have this left uh, frontotemporal response. So um, what does this mean? Um, it means we can study it in babies. They're, they're 14 to 18 months old, and uh, maybe, as uh, you were saying, that it's going to be possible to do something clinically important. To me, it's, it's really interesting because, to me, it means that maybe babies are learning words in, in, in a way that's as much top-down as bottom-up, that, uh, you know, they aren't just doing it through some sort of, uh, you know, massive exposure of, of a, millions of words over time that they abstract from repeated sensory presentations, more and more abstract representations. I'm sure that's going on. But at the same time, there's something coming from the most cognitive levels of the brain that is abstract and is, is, is organizing this learning. Um, another special group that we're not going to get in, in the... Uh, epilepsy unit is, uh, is native deaf signers. And uh, so we have been studying them. Uh, this is uh, 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 Ferian Ramirez and Leonard and uh, Mayberry. And um, uh, we find, again, that 
there is very similar responses to incongruous versus congruous words in the, the deaf, uh, the native deaf, and in the, the hearing, even though you know, their auditory cortex has is, is not um, been used uh, for audition uh, during their life. And they, they don't show any early response in their auditory cortex of visual stimuli. There's no evidence for rewiring. It seems to be really that this, this cortex is used for that. This cortex is used for lexicosemantic encoding. And uh, whether you, you are using signs or using uh, visual words or using auditory words, it's still being, being done in the same way. Okay, now we can go to these fundamental issues. And I have 12 minutes. Um, so, the first question, is acoustophonetic processing affected by the context? Uh, so, one typical uh, effect that has been around for a while is the Ganong effect, and uh, uh, so that is you're more likely to hear a D if it's presented within the word duck than if it's presented within the word desh, right? So, the lexical contact context is affecting your perception, your, your reported perception. You have to decide, what am I hearing? And so uh, that has led to a series of models by very f some of the earliest models of, of, uh, of you know, the uh, PDP models of uh, Elman and McClelland. Um, and uh, those models have arrows going both ways between the words and the letters, right? They are interactive models. That's very controversial, though. Uh, Norris, that's been cut off here, I'm sorry, um, has, uh, among others, but in, in Norris's merge model, there is a unidirectional influence, and the bidirectional influence is occurring in a separate structure. And you can reproduce everything doing that. And, and you know, maybe, you know, you ask somebody, what you hear? Maybe that's a different process than actually, you know, processing speech uh, online. So uh, Katie and, and Matt designed this study where, uh, again, you see a picture, you hear the word, cat, picture, word, or you, you, you hear cat, but after the cat, or you hear a noise that matches cat. So this comparison is going to tell you the acoustophonemic processing, and this comparison is going to give you the lexicosemantic. And you pre-present this picture, so, so the, the process is the, the, the context is there before. So you'd expect that maybe um, the incongruity effect should start at the same time as the processing. But in fact, it's 120 milliseconds later. Long time. And here's, some, here's an individual sensor, our favorite sensor here above, uh, you know, I don't know, Wernicke's area. And um, uh, you can see between words and noise, you get a big difference. And that starts at about 60 milliseconds. And between Congress and incongruous words, they're right on top of each other until here. And then they start differentiating way out here. So uh, and then these are just the maps. So that's uh, interesting and uh, maybe you know, supports one type of psychological model. And then we went inside the brain to try and see if we could get supportive evidence. And uh, this is from a grid, big grid and a microgrid. The microgrid space at one millimeter. These are space at one centimeter. And uh, we're, we're looking here at the high gamma power and, and the uh, local field potentials. And it, it just seems to be that the, uh, this early... Uh, difference between words and noise, which is on this side, at about 100 milliseconds, is in different places often than the later difference between Congress and incongruous words, even at, at a very sm small scale. So maybe there is also a, a spatial differentiation early. And the, 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 the problem with this experiment, even though David and other people have done studies that have, many people have done studies showing that about this latency around, you know, 100 milliseconds or less, there is uh, phonetic, you know, different phonemes or, or, or if you move back and forth, the voice onset time, blah, blah, you, you get differences in this, this time domain. Uh, 
we wanted to verify that, and so we looked at this word noise contrast, and we compared that to a, uh, a NOVA that looked at the variation between different consonants uh, in real words. And uh, it, this, this consonant difference was, was happening in, in the same places and about the same time as the word noise difference. So that makes us feel better, that, that we're really looking at a, um, uh, the early parts of word processing, of word understanding. Now I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. This is where we somehow, uh, this patient was uh, slated for an anterior temporal lobectomy and before the lobectomy we were able to record from uh, an uh, electrode right here uh, in the posterior margin of the, the resection. And um, we, this is like 96 contacts and recorded about 120 units and uh, plus and under many, many different tasks. And this is uh, a uh, inhibitory interneuron. This is an excitatory uh, cell, you know, they're, they're blah, blah, blah. It's, it's mar marvelous um, technology. And uh, these cells are responding specifically to words. They don't respond to tones. They don't respond to, you know, uh, clocks or staplers or harps or whatever. And uh, they respond less to backwards and forwards words. And they, they, they do show this word noise response at the same time that they're showing this very high level of um, discrimination between different phonemes or um, between different words. These, these cells are responding to particular words uh, and to, to particular phonemes. And so uh, we're a little cut off here, but... but uh, this is consistent, given this location, with uh, the model that uh, has been proposed by uh, Rutchecker, uh, and that is that language words are understood through this dorsal stream going forward from Heschel's gyrus instead of the classical idea that they're understood by going backwards to the planum and around, you know, supermarginal gyrus and the arcuate fasciculus forward, that that's used for articulation and for maybe, you know, spatial location or something, but that these are being used for understanding uh, which speech it is, which word it is. And then, so we have a model that would, would go like this. Well, uh, I'm about to change to orange, uh, and I'm going to talk about this next problem of do written words have to be phonologically recoded before lexical access? Wait a minute, am I, am I orange or am I yellow? Am I red? Am I, am I at 40? Hmm. I thought it was green there for a while. Uh, all right. Well, um, I, I will, I will, uh, I'll talk about that during the, I'll talk about these last two questions if people want to hear about them. Three minutes? Okay. I will do it. So, um, Basically, uh, phonological recoding, I explained to you what that is, and, and there is uh, a lot of psychological literature. One part of that psychological literature says that we recode words automatically, but that we don't use that for understanding what word it is unless we are a poor reader or it's a difficult word. All right? And that's from Seidenberg a long time ago. And uh, you'll notice this is the, the same thing that I was showing you from Anders, uh, that by 185 milliseconds, uh, you are getting some activation up here, we, we imagine, to, to um, uh, written words. So, uh, Ksenia, again, uh, Marinkovich did a study where she looked at the N400 uh, with Meg to, uh, to, to, to heard words versus uh, read words, and it seems like it's the same, same N400. So that would be consistent with this... Um, this idea that, that in order to access the word, you have to go up into the, the meaning of the word to a visual, you have to go up here. You have to go to the, the, uh, the dorsal uh, part. Now this, uh, I'll just say, in fact, we find that there are modality-specific N400s, and I can't go into this, this slide more except to say there are modality-specific N400s, and so that is inconsistent with this phonological, obligatory phonological recoding. But this is the kicker, this is, this is, the, this is the really um, exciting result, which is that if you show a, in, in, in two of these units, 
uh, in this, um, this recording, we're responding to both visual and auditory words. And uh, the responses to individual sounds of letters and to individual written letters were correlated. All right? So that is really phonological recoding. And that shows what you can find out with single units that you could never find out with any other method. So uh, you, you understand what this is? So you see a word, uh, a letter, and you hear the sound of that letter in, within words, and they are highly correlated. And the time of this seems to start at a time when this is R prime using a moving window. Moving window starting at uh, 175 was able to significantly classify uh, was, was, was significantly correlated between the, the, the modalities. So that's probably early enough to contribute to phonological recoding, to, to, um, to understanding a word from its, um, from, its, uh, from its sound when you read it. So uh, this is uh, related to the earlier work that, that Apostolos showed, um, and here we're decoding, Alex Chan is decoding uh, which uh, uh, word you're being presented, or which, whether it's an object or an animal, based upon uh, uh, a, a um, machine uh, learning uh, paradigm, and uh, this is with Meg. And uh, we we're able to replicate that with intracranial results, and I'm going to show you one, and that is that starting at 200 milliseconds in, in first pass processing in the ventral stream here, an anteroventral temporal lobe, you're discriminating between words and objects in, in unit activity or current source density. And what this means is that in this first pass template, you know that the word refers to, a written word refers to an object or an animal, probably quite a bit before you know what word it is. So semantics are not after uh, lexical identification. Thank you. Time for questions. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to speculate on what might be going wrong when things go wrong, like in kids with SLI or individuals who have a stroke. Is it, is it a timing thing? Is it a coherence thing? What's, there's so many possible explanations based on what you showed today. Well, <clears throat> I would imagine that uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing that we're able to do it at all, right? I mean, that we can see these tiny differences in, in either auditory or sensory stimuli and within, you know, a few 300 milliseconds, pick out the word out of thousands of possibilities so, uh, and integrate it with all our knowledge. So that is, uh, you know, it's amazing what we can do. You know, from no, no matter what the IQ, people can still do it. So uh, I think this is a very complex system, and probably in different people, different things go wrong. And maybe the ultimately what we can contribute as brain imagers Oh, is, is, you know, methods to distinguish different things that can go wrong. Yes, right. Hi, uh, uh, for the work that Katie has been doing, I was just wondering, are you doing a, a head movement compensation on the baby, on the infants? And if not, then how do you uh, deal with that? Katie sits in the room with the babies. We aren't doing it. I mean, we've, we've tried. It just didn't really... I mean, we didn't need to, we didn't have to, and, and then it just seemed complicated and, you know, more, more effort than it was worth. Uh, so Katie sits in, in there with a baby, and she says, now, and, and, and the, 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 the recording says, look, and the, it comes on, and, and she, doesn't, she starts the trial by pressing a button when she sees that the baby is ready and is looking. And then it's presented, and the baby's looking because it's interesting, and then, then the look, and then, then the word. And so, you know, they're packed in really well, and so we, we, that, that seems to work good enough. Okay. I'm curious just that the, the model, if I hear cat, and I haven't yet recognized 
the word. I haven't even finished analyzing the sounds or the letters. How do the cat features become activated such that they perceive that I then recognize the word? I mean, how? See, since you since you concluded oh, wait, wait, you're saying that the semantics actually mm -hmm. are at least uh, at the same time or precede the access to the word form. <laughs> I guess I want to I'd yeah. like to hear how that actually works. Well, well not, what, what, so, 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 so obvious how that might. It's not so obvious, is it? No, but but the um, so here's, here's my thought. I mean, we've only seen that with visual, uh, with auditory. We don't have these these same laminar recordings, okay, that have shown the first pass processing. So I'm not sure it happens with auditory. That's another problem. But you can see these cells in the anterior middle anterior superior temporal gyrus are responding to individual words long before you know what word it is. So it's just they are pattern separation machines, right? So you get a stimulus, and, and they are discriminable based on, on sounds somehow, and so they, they discriminate them. And, and uh, in, so I don't know beyond that because the actual point in time when you can distinguish between cat and catch maybe hasn't been, been met. So how do you do that? Uh, you know, then you're just dealing with probabilities and how those propagate through. We don't know that. In the visual system, you have all of the information. And I would argue that there is no difference in principle between recognizing something as an, it, visually as an animal or an object and recognizing words that refer to objects and animals. You know, objects maybe have more similarity between them. I don't really know that they do. You know, a hammer and a, and a chair and, and a car. Those are pretty different, right? And, you know, uh, a snake and a, and a giraffe. So we don't have any trouble with the concept that we have these, these, these uh, visual processors that can distinguish between um, different, pick different objects by their appearance, but we somehow have a problem with imagining that that can't work for words too. Maybe we have, you know, this direct pathway through the visual stream that's recognizing words as objects, as as visual stimuli. And that you take this whole set of visual stimuli that match, you know, objectness, and they're getting a feed forward, right, from the it passes in two two streams. They're going in parallel and they're converging up there. One stream is going through the object in animal areas and are making an early discrimination right between them uh, based on what it looks like and the other and the meaning and the other part is going and, and meeting back at the uh, in the, the front you know so with with just some information about the shape of the word of the written word so that is you know an associative um, uh, uh, Convergence causing uh, long-term potentiation. So I, I think I think we have to have our minds open to that that happening, uh, that that we can recognize the meaning of of words based directly on their appearance rather than their um, their the, their their lexical their lemma, right? All right. I think. Uh, can I have a quick, quick question? <laughs> Should we take a vote? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Just uh, building on David's question, I was curious. One way of looking at this semantics preceding lexical access, what about frequency effects? So if you could actually modulate semantic activation based on the frequency of the word, you could predict whether the semantics precedes lexical access or not. Right. Well, frequency effects are very interesting, and I think they they have they they are very early. Frequency effects are very early, and so are like frequency of bigrams and trigrams and and all of that. You know, in in so I think that uh, it's it's all the same thing. I think it's it it is. There are very early effects in in the visual stream. We're we're designed for that. I think. But maybe I'm wrong. I, I think I think the first pass is is very strong. All right, time to thank the speaker again.